I'm Sean Grosscheck. Welcome to SITREP, your weekly look at the big issues in defence and world affairs. The new man to lead the Royal Air Force is named, and for the first time, it's not a pilot. So who is Air Marshal Sir Richard Knighton, and what does he want to get done? We are going to have to fight for control of the air in the future. And that control might be limited in time and geography, but that for an Air Force is going to be our fundamental core purpose as we think about the future. We'll get the thoughts of one of his predecessors and our explainer in chief, Professor Michael Clark. NATO just got bigger, but does the addition of Finland make the alliance better? The Finns are able, with their reserves, to mobilise nearly a quarter of a million soldiers. And having a country join which really adds to NATO's military capabilities rather than demands a great deal of NATO protection is going to be an asset. And why have Royal Marines just been deployed on exercise in South Korea for the first time in 70 years? Which translates as, one hand can't clap by itself. I can't believe it. A quarter of the way through 2023 already, Mike. Have you chosen your most significant event yet? Oh, no, not yet. Uh, 2023 is going to be a humdinger uh, for all sorts of reasons, not just because of the war in Ukraine, but because of what's happening between China and America and a lot of other um, developments which are taking place as it were just under the surface of politics. So, no, no, um, whatever is going to happen this year will still astonish us compared to what has happened so far. All right, well, plenty to talk to you about throughout the programme today. Uh, We'll talk later about what else the year might yet throw at us, but let's start with someone who'll be in charge of dealing with those events. The new Chief of the Air Staff, Air Marshal Sir Richard Knighton, has been named to take on the RAF's top job. He will step up from his current role. At the moment, he's Deputy Commander, Capability and People in two months' time. Um, Air Marshal Knighton has served since 1988 and is an engineer by background. With us is someone who took the exact same step up 10 years ago. Air Chief Marshal Sir Andrew Polford was Chief of the Air Staff from 2013 to 2016. Um, Thanks very much indeed for joining us. We'll talk about the job he's taking on in a minute, but can we just get something else out of the way first? Air Marshal Nyson is the first non-pilot to take on the top job. Is it a big deal or is it just us journalists looking for a headline? who are making it a big deal? Um, It's a bit of both, to be fair. I think uh, the media made a big thing of me being the first non-fixed-wing pilot to command the Air Force 10 years ago, because my background, of course, as a helicopter pilot was different to all those that had gone before me. Um, And you know what? You know, three years later, everybody had forgotten that, and it was all about me, my skills, my capabilities, uh, and what I was able to do commanding the Air Force. And I think Rich Rich Knighton will be exactly the same. He's an absolutely outstanding officer. He's absolutely the right man for the job. Uh, and uh, we'll very quickly forget that he's, not, that he's not a pilot. Does it mean more to the personnel on the ground, um, just sort of having what they feel is, is a champion of, of their specialism? Is that more what it means in terms of the significance to, to personnel? Yeah, I saw, and I think that's a, an absolutely top point. It, it indicates that the Royal Air Force is a true meritocracy. Regardless of your background now, Rich Knighton's appointment shows that you can reach the very top. It's not an old boys club um, of old. This is now about selecting somebody with the right skill set, with the correct experience. And I know Rich Knighton is going to make an absolutely first class piece of their stuff. I was going to say, because he was your assistant chief of air staff, what kind of leadership can the men and women of the RAF expect from him? Well, first and foremost, he's clearly got the professional challenges of of an Air Force uh, which is operating in a very unpredictable and difficult world, and and he'll lean into that. And his background within uh, the capability area of MOD, uh, the resources and planning side, as well as his engineering background, uh, means he's very well placed to understand the strategic dynamics of this world of ours and, and indeed Europe and London. Uh, beyond that, he's a pe- he's a people's person. Um, he's uh, approachable. Uh, he's got a great sense of humour, and uh, he will understand all aspects of his service, uh, and would add will add value to that throughout his time in command. And let's talk about the job itself. What takes up your time, and what do you have to deliver uh, when you're in the top job? 
<laughs> yes. what takes up your time, just about everything, and there's never enough time. Um, he is, of course, the professional head of his service, uh, is going to be uh, the commander of the Royal Air Force responsible through uh, the Secretary of State for Defence to the Prime Minister and the government for the health and operational capability of his service. And uh, that's everything from recruiting through training to maintaining that operational edge, which is uh, you know, as important as it's ever been uh, in a world where we are facing uh, so, so many threats. There's the representational. We've all seen you know, the Chiefs of Staff laying the wreaths uh, in, in Whitehall on Remembrance Sunday, you know, probably the most poignant uh, and most proud moment of my time in command, those three opportunities, opportunities to do that. But most importantly, he'll be responsible for the fighting edge, as you've heard, heard him talking earlier, um, of his service, maintaining uh, the defense of the UK airspace and our dependent territories, ensuring that his service is able to maintain the fight in Iraq and Syria against Daesh, and of course, making a superb and large-scale commitment to NATO, securing the sky of Europe against any threat from, uh, from Russia. And, and uh, let's face it, that, that has been going on since the day of the invasion. There have been combat air patrols along the length of the NATO border with Russia, ensuring that, that we sleep safely. Such a highly pressurized job. I guess there are, there are no moments where you can just stop and take a breath. <laughs> occasionally, occasionally. Uh, but do you know what? You know, working for the people of the Royal Air Force in the same way the people of the Royal Navy and the British Army, um, we are the best of the best uh, in the British military. I have no doubt about that uh, after 40 years serving with all three services. And uh, you don't really need to, time to take breath. The, the, the people are in themselves, the, the invigorators. They, they drive the enthusiasm within you to do better for them. Let's bring Mike in for a sec. Mike, give us the outsider's view for a moment. In, in relative terms, how challenging a time is this for Air Marshal Knight and to be taking on the RAF's top job? Oh, it's very challenging. I mean, not just because there's a war in Europe, as Sir Andrew said, but I mean, if you look at the, what now the Air Force needs to cover, you know, it's from space down to a kind of a new area of airspace, which is below five or 10,000 feet, which is the Battle of the Drones. We, this is the first time now we're seeing r really contested airspace down at that low level. And that's a matter of not just of shooting down drones from the ground or competing with them from the air, electronically jamming them. It's a whole new battle that's opening up, that what I would call the battle of the drones, which didn't really exist until this war in Ukraine in any appreciable way. And as Sir Andrew said, I mean, you know, the Air Force is extraordinarily world class in terms of its equipment and what it does and its expertise. But it's very small. It's extremely small. And the question is, you know, how far can you stretch a small force, which is, doesn't look as if it's going to grow that much more as we face the challenges? And one of the things that all chief of air staffs have to grapple with, it's like being a CEO or like being a chief executive officer. And you're only doing it for three years. I mean, if you're a CEO of a firm of comparable size and importance, you wouldn't dream of having a CEO only in place for three years. And so this, this rotation, natural rotation of chiefs is always difficult. So yes, of course, chiefs can represent the service, but how much can they manage the service in a relatively short time? And there's an awful lot to manage in the air environment that the RAF now faces. And as with each new CEO with companies, everyone has a different idea, um, different personality and approach to all of that, um, which, which adds extra challenges in terms of change for the workforce as well, doesn't it? That, that's important, Sean, because to see change in a service, you need to look at two or three chiefs in line, as it were. Do they all want the same thing? Is there a generation of three chiefs covering nine or ten years where things change during that decade because those three chiefs thought the same way and had the the same sort of managerial skills. That doesn't always happen. Sometimes it's a matter of coincidence when it does happen. Yeah, a couple of issues to that. Um, uh, firstly, I, I just wish I had the, uh, the, the power and the ability to make all that change that uh, Michael's talking about uh, all on my own, because of course you can't and you don't. Uh, you fit the Air Force and you fit your own ambitions, A, into the existing strategy that has been set by those before you, and indeed that you've been part of. Let's not forget, you're not being parachuted in from another company. You've been part of the growth. You've helped develop the forward-looking strategy. Um, and you have then have to fit that into the broader defense strategy 
as dictated by the Ministry of Defence and indeed, you know, the political ambitions of the government, their ambitions both globally, within Europe and for the, U- the uh, armed forces within the UK and its role on behalf of the British people. And in that clip at the start of the programme, we heard him speaking about the fight to keep control of the air, the RAF's fundamental core purpose. So what does that tell you about his to-do list on day one? It's going to be a pretty big inbox, isn't it? It is, and it, it always has been. I think every chief of air staff on their first day will tell you that. Um, but he is taking over a service that is, is heavily committed. It's engaged. And that doesn't matter whether it's, uh, it's the airspace around the UK, down in the Falklands, uh, providing that deterrent factor there. But of course, within two operational theatres, uh, one in Europe, deterrence against Russia. Uh, but also, of course, not, let's not forget that, uh, that Iraq and Syria are still, uh, still ongoing operations. All right, Sir Andrew, thank you very much indeed uh, for sharing your thoughts with us. This is Sidrep. This week, it's the 74th anniversary of NATO's foundation. But as ministers gathered in Brussels, their celebrations were not for the alliance's birthday. Welcome to this ceremony in honour of the accession of NATO to our latest member, the Republic of Finland. President Putin wanted to slam NATO's door shut. Today, we show the world that he failed. It is uh, a great day for Finland and it is uh, an important day for NATO too. I'm tempted to say this is maybe the one thing uh, we can thank Mr. Putin for because he uh, once again here has precipitated something he claims to want to uh, prevent. Well, with the raising of a flag, Russia and NATO's shared border suddenly doubled in length. It's an extra 832 miles that the UK and every other ally is committed to defending if needs be. But Finland isn't some guest showing up late to the party empty-handed. It brings significant military capability with it to NATO. BFBS reporter Tom Sables has been delving through the fact file... Tom, uh, great to have you with us. Let's start with the people. Finland's got a population of 5.5 million. That's only half the population of Moscow. So how many personnel can they mobilise? Well, it's a big number, around one quarter of a million. So a significant addition to the alliance, which is something plenty member states can't honestly say when they join, as you alluded to there. And this is mostly due to a reserve force of more than 230,000, which has gone some way in opening NATO's door. So they can manage this through conscription. That's how they do this. Women can volunteer. But if you're a man, once you're 18, you get the call up. So eight weeks of basic training, and then you're you're assigned a spot, essentially. So about one year of solid service for leaders. So your officers, your non-commissioned officers and your specialists. For others, it's five and a half or eight and a half months. So they're well trained. Service ends with a huge test called Final War, which, as you can imagine, does what it says on the tin. And uh, crucially, once you're done, you're sent into that huge reservist pool we mentioned, which outnumbers the entire UK armed forces, including our reserves. Uh, There's a routine refresher course for all of those reserves up until the age of 60. So conscripts really do underpin Finland's forces. For example, if you take the army, uh, there's two waves of 9,000 conscripts every year replenishing what is the main bulk of that service. It's really fascinating when when you drill down into that detail and you realise the level of experience uh, the average person on the street has from a military point of view. If territorial defence is the main job, what does Finland's land hardware look like? Not bad either. A territorial stance usually would imply that you're not considered much of an invasion threat by others. So it's worth bearing that in mind when you look at their army figures, for example. When it comes to main battle tanks, they've got 100 Leopard 2A6s and 100 more slightly older Leopard 2s as well. There's been a huge demand for that calibre of tank in Ukraine, as we're well aware. Sticking with Ukraine, we've seen artillery play a huge role there. So Finland actually trumps the UK again, slightly in numbers there. Of the 682 artillery systems, 56 are actually multiple launch rocket designs. So high tech there. Uh, Taking threats out of the sky, 
Most of its surface-to-air missiles are short-range. Mike, although Finland's only been in NATO for a matter of days, it's not a stranger to working with other NATO forces, and particularly the UK. No, it isn't. I mean, since the end of the Cold War, uh, NATO and Sweden have got closer together and Finland has been part of that process um, because effectively they've been invited to summits. They've done a certain amount of planning and contingency work. Uh, Finnish uh, forces have cooperated with NATO forces on uh, surveillance operations and air policing and air defense operations. In a way, Finland now and even Sweden, they've been almost in the alliance for some years. What they've lacked is the Article 5 guarantee. And that, in a way, beyond the symbolism of what happened this week with Finland joining NATO, it's the fact that they're now part of the Article 5 guarantee arrangement, which means that an attack on one is regarded as an attack on all. That's a big step, but it's the only step that hasn't already been taken in effect. I guess it's almost like going from a recognised long-term relationship to officially being married. Yes, something like that. And I think as somebody said, I think it was Jamie Shea who made the point that um, the longer the engagement, the happier the marriage. Well, I'm not sure about that, but that's (laughs) that's the view. (laughs) Um, Well, Tom, let's talk sea and air power. How big a punch can Finland pack there? Well, as we touched on before, I think really if you've spent all of this these years actually focused more on defending your borders than rolling or flying over them, it will affect how things look now. As things stand, you've got 62 FA-18 fighter ground attack aircraft um, and no doubt a ha- handful of helicopters, mostly transport though. They've also got uh, light transport capabilities, so Airbus C295Ms. They've got 11 of them and then one also kitted out for electronic intelligence. As for the Navy then, you're looking at 20 patrol and coastal combatant, combatant vessels. Um, we're looking at very niche capabilities here, which is something we get on to, but mine warfare, you've got eight vessels, 52 amphibious landing craft, and as for logistics and support vessels, you have seven. Mike, this is where that phrase multi-domain integration comes in. Do Finland's land, sea and air capabilities look in balance to get the best out of all of them? Uh, not really, uh, not in NATO terms, because they're much heavier on land than they are in air and, and sea. But in a way, that doesn't matter. I mean, the, the Ministry of Defence at the moment is thinking in terms of if there was a, a, a need to mobilise NATO, that Finland's forces don't need to stay in Finland. I mean, their, their ground forces are so useful that they'd be better off somewhere else, going south, for instance, towards the uh, the Polish border or even the German border. And NATO has got plenty of maritime assets in which it could protect the Baltics and p- could protect the Gulf of Finland. So, in a way, it's not, it's not that Finland comes as a ready-made air, land and sea power. It comes as a land power, but that's OK, because the air and sea power from NATO as a whole can actually rebalance that. And I think in years to come, we'll be looking at Finland not as a, a player that um, simply defends itself, but as a player that contributes to quite a lot of other areas of NATO, mainly with ground forces. Tom, you've set out Finland's capabilities now. What about their modernization plans? Well, we've touched on interoperability and ways of working together, but in some ways NATO will have wanted to have seen more than that. So notably, the chief of the alliance mentioned the commitment to buy 64 F-35A jets. Now, this is very, very high-tech equipment, and that will have cost them just over $9 billion to replace the F-A-18s I mentioned before. Uh, That will be phased in, hopefully, we're starting at 2027 to bring those into the Finnish Air Force. And it would actually trump the UK's 47 F-35Bs, slightly different model, same idea, uh, by around halfway through the decade, although the UK is looking, uh, I believe, still for 130 plus as a target number. But this is a solid order that's been placed. As for the Navy, we've already heard about how the limited numbers there are being addressed. So the former flagship, four four fast attack missile crafts and two mine layers are actually being replaced with corvettes. We're going from seven to four vessels in total. But the idea of what we're seeing here is more versatile vessels that can take on a a greater number of roles. They're less niche. And that's something we've seen the UK and other NATO members look to develop with their frigates, for example. The idea is that it could then potentially work in 
friendly carrier strike groups and do what the alliance demands of it. Tom, thank you very much indeed for that. Mike, Finland adds territory roughly the size of Germany into NATO's defence commitments. On the one hand, it might seem hard not to see that as another burden, but on the other, does that territory offer some strategic advantages? Uh, Yes, it certainly does. Not only does it add, what, 830-odd miles to the border with Russia, and of course that's a a commitment and a burden, but it also means that any Moscow defence planners have got to take account of that. So it gives the Russians, whatever the Russians Russians may be trying to do in military terms, it gives them something else to worry about. Um, But also it adds strategic depth to NATO. It gives NATO some territorial depth, both in the Baltic in general, but in particular for the three Baltic states, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania. With Finland in the alliance and the Baltic now much more secure, it's an open seaway, of course, but it really is a NATO sea. That gives some real strategic depth to the defence of Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania. And all of the um, leaders of those countries would say, we want to be defended, not liberated. What's it going to mean for the UK's armed forces? I mean, are we likely to be Finland's mentor coming into NATO? In some ways, I think we already are. Um, the I know that the army has been having quite a lot of constructive conversations with Finnish forces precisely about this question of where are Finland's ground forces best suited if they need to mobilise for some purpose. Um, in other words, Finland can be defended within NATO with fewer than they are going to mobilise. So where are they best suited and what could the Brits do in, a, in order to help a more flexible use of Finnish armed forces? Th- those conversations, I understand, are at a fairly early stage, but it's interesting that they're taking place at all. I think Finland will be a really useful, important member of the alliance. I've said that this is the most important uh, enlargement of NATO since German rearmament in 1955. Um, Nothing since 1955 has approached the importance of this in a military sense. And I think we should be aware of that as we take it forward. News, discussions and analysis. This is Zitrap. Now, we'll turn our attention to a country five and a half thousand miles from the UK. South Korea has caught our attention for two reasons this week. First, we learned that a company of Royal Marines from 40 Commando has been in South Korea taking part in a major exercise with forces from the Republic and the US. It's the first time Royal Marines have been deployed to the Korean Peninsula since the war that split it into two countries 70 years ago. Then we saw Korea's foreign minister at NATO, along with colleagues from Japan, New Zealand and Australia. So what, if anything, should we read into all of this? I'm very happy to say that Dr Edward Howell is here to help us make sense of it all. Um, His research at Oxford University specialises in the politics and international relations of the Korean Peninsula. Uh, Welcome to the programme, uh, Dr Howell. I guess a lot of people might be wondering, Royal Marines sent to South Korea for the first time since the war. Is it just symbolic or significant? And what's the so what here? I think first and foremost, we need to remember that um, even though the UK is not obliged to defend South Korea if if attacked, the relationship between the United Kingdom and South Korea is one that is an historic relationship um, that goes all the way back to the Korean War. And the latest events that we see involving the Royal Marines really does emphasize this, this strength of bilateral Um, strategic and political relationship over time. And actually, joint exercises involving uh, the US and South Korea are very common, as we know. But only a couple of years ago, we saw the UK and South Korea involving the um, HMS Queen Elizabeth actually get involved in joint naval exercises there. And Britain is no stranger to this. British and South Korean naval forces have also taken part in um, the biennial rim of the Pacific military exercises. So is it symbolic? Well, yes, it represents a concerted effort by South Korea at the moment um, to to, um, strengthen its relations with its allies, but um, it is not new. With it being the first time Royal Marines have been deployed to the Korean Peninsula, though, when you think about... 70 years, some people might be wondering, you know, why has it taken so long for this, for us to, to, to see this unfold? 
Yes, and I think what we're seeing is that particularly over the last two or three years since the the first integrated review, we see the UK's tilt to the Indo-Pacific really being manifest in sort of realities, particularly in terms of how for the UK, South Korea now is not just an economic partner, it is a military partner, it is a strategic partner, and it's a political partner. And this happened. This has happened now, I think, for two related reasons. The first, given how um, the UN administration in South Korea has really sought to strengthen South Korea's role as a global pivotal state, promoting value-based diplomacy with, with allies with which it shares common values of rule of law, human rights, democracy. Secondly, and relatedly, Russia's war in the Ukraine and South Korea's, albeit indirect, participation through the supply of weapons to Ukraine via Poland. And again, this has really catalyzed South Korea's stronger role with NATO as well. What's in it for the UK, though? For the UK, South Korea is a crucial part of the broader um, Indo-Pacific The integrated review refresh earlier this year said that defence tilt to the Indo-Pacific had already been achieved. In my view, it's an ongoing process. And I think South Korea offers the UK a very strong opportunity for the UK to be seen as an upholder of the liberal international order at a time when it is under threat. You mentioned the integrated review there, and we've had the refresh fairly recently. Can the UK afford uh, to be sending more support to that neck of the woods? In my view, I think if the UK were to neglect um, the Indo-Pacific, now is not the time to do so. We know the integrated integrated review has proposed to increase um, the UK's uh, military spending. We know that the UK has highlighted key target areas, particularly Uh, to counter the threat of China. And South Korea is a key partner here. And let's talk about what happened last week. North Korea revealing what it says are short-range tactical nuclear weapons, which could hit South Korea without posing nearly as much threat to the North. How real is the risk of military conflict between these neighbours right now? Firstly, I think we should treat these claims obviously with scepticism. The photographs that were seen on North Korean media they could be deceptive. Uh, Linked to that point, however, um, is the fact that North Korea is increasing the scope and sophistication of its missile capabilities. I think that is a certainty. Is it going to conduct a seventh nuclear test now in three months or in six months? That is for the North Korean regime to decide. What's the potential for, for military conflict on the peninsula? I think Kim Jong un knows that nuclear weapons are a guarantee of regime survival. Um, I think he knows that any conflict has the potential to escalate particularly rapidly. Does that mean that the international community should stop calling on North Korea to denuclearize? I think that we need to find a way, perhaps a, a creative method, but denuclearization should still be the ultimate goal. We've seen that tensions on the peninsula have escalated, but I don't think yet we're back to sort of the days of fire and fury as we were under the early months of President Trump. All right, Dr. Edward Howell, thank you very much indeed for giving us your analysis. Thank you. Mike, it struck me that despite the historic nature of that company of Marines from 40 Commando deploying on exercise in South Korea, it was only mentioned publicly after it was completed. What do you make of it? Yes, I mean, that shows how real it was because they wanted to do it for good military reasons, not just symbolic reasons, but they didn't want to create an international incident out of it or actually, as it were, trumpet it too loudly. So it shows that they, it, it's a good piece of military diplomacy and military planning. It, and and it's, it shows, too, how closely, you know, United States, Britain, Japan and South Korea are drawing together on very specific military issues. Very interesting development. 
Professor Michael Clark, thank you. And my thanks to all of our guests today. That's all for now. We'll be back with another sit rep next Thursday. And if you want to listen online, you can now find us on the Forces News YouTube channel, as well as at home at bfbs.com forward slash sit rep or wherever you download your podcasts. For now, though, from me, Sean Greshek and the rest of the team, thanks for listening. Goodbye. (laughs) 